Okay, let's give the students a minute to uh, log in, and then we'll begin. If there's no questions, I'm going to begin. So somebody who's uh, online, can you, uh, what the heck is this? <clears throat> can you uh, say that uh, you, you got my screen? Yeah, I can see it. All right, great. All right, so what we're doing today is working on uh, microbial genetics. Uh, this week you have a quiz. The quiz will be due on Wednesday. Sorry, my voice is a little hoarse here. So let me see if I can use this, that'll help. And then I can speak maybe quieter and save my voice. <clears throat> Not sure what the problem is. Uh, the quiz is going to cover chapters five and six in the lecture, and then lab seven. The quiz is due at 11.59 p.m. on Wednesday. Are there any questions about that? We'll be working on chapter eight. We might even finish it, which will mean we'll start chapter 14 a little early. Uh, and then today we have lab nine that we'll be talking about at, uh, what time is the lab, 6.30? I should know that, but yes, yeah, 6.30, got it right. All right, any question about what we're doing? If not, let's begin Chapter 8. I think I'll leave this up because I'll talk about it with the uh, lab at 6.30. So last time we talked about the uh, summary. We talked about the structure and function of the genetic material the flow of genetic information, how DNA replication happens, how RNA transcription happens, and how protein translation happens. Are you hearing me okay? My voice is really hoarse today, and I'm not sure why that is. Actually, oh, I, I haven't you. talked until today, uh, now, so I didn't even know my voice was hoarse. Are you guys hearing me okay? Yeah. Great. Uh, we're going to move on to the regulation of bacterial gene expression. We'll talk about operons. We will briefly talk about mutations. You're going to do that in the worksheet for this chapter. We'll then move on to genetic transfer and genetic recombination. And then lastly, We'll talk about genes and evolution. Any question about what we're doing? Okay, so we're going to talk about the regulation of gene expression. One way to regulate a cell is to control gene expression. If you don't need a gene, you can turn it off. On the other hand, if you want the gene, you can turn it on. There are different ways of controlling gene expression. Constitutive enzymes are expressed at a fixed rate, so the genes coding the constitutive enzymes are always turned on. Other enzymes are expressed only as needed, and there are two ways of doing this. You can have a repressible gene, so the enzyme is repressible, or you can have an inducible enzyme where their gene is inducible. You can also regulate uh, genes by pre-transcriptional control, and we'll talk about that with inducible operons. So we'll talk about an inducible operon and talk about inducible operons in general. You can also have repressible operons and you can control genes by epigenetic control means. 
And then there's post transcriptional control, meaning the gene will be transcribed and then you control the gene uh, post transcriptional. Uh, we're not going to talk about regressible operons and you will not be tested on that. We're not going to talk about epigenetic control. You'll not be tested on that. And you will not be tested on post transcriptional control. Does it make sense for a cell to make a product if it is not needed? Can anyone answer that? No, it doesn't have to do anything. I think that was a no, is that correct? Uh, I'm getting out of the picture because I'm going to get a cough drop. Uh, so if the gene is not needed, you do not generally want to express it. Any questions about that? So we're going to talk about ex gene expression and we're going to use the operon model. Now operons, you can think of them as a super gene. An operon contains one or more structural gene. And we're going to talk about bacterial operons. And they, well, generally have one structural gene, but they can have other structural genes. If they have other structural genes, then the other structural genes are related, well, they're all related to each other. For example, the LAC operon, which is involved in the metabolism of the sugar lactose, has three structural genes. And I should mention that when we talk about a gene, we usually mean a structural gene. Like when we talk about the blue eye gene, we're talking about a structural gene. An operon contains the structural gene and then controlling regions around the structural gene. And if we're talking about a bacterial operon, there may be more than one structural gene. So in the LAC operon, Z codes for the enzyme lactase to metabolize the sugar lactose. Any questions about that? Now, the LAC operon has two other structural genes. The Y gene and the A structural gene, I said gene and I meant structural gene, are other genes that are involved in the metabolism of the sugar lactose. The Y gene codes for the transport protein that brings the sugar lactose across the cell membrane and then brings the sugar into the cell. Uh, the Z gene, of course, metabolizes the sugar lactose into galactose and glucose. Glucose can be used directly by the cell, but galactose has to be converted into glucose before it can be used. And the A structural gene in the uh, LAC operon is involved in converting the sugar galactose to the sugar glucose. Any question about the structural genes? Now, in the LAC operon, we have more than just a structural gene. We have the controlling regions around the structural genes. 
we have the promoter, which I've already talked about, and the operator. The promoter, if you remember, is the site where the RNA polymerase binds to the DNA. So the promoter is a region of DNA that codes for the RNA polymerase to bind to it. And then the RNA polymerase moves down from the promoter, transcribing the gene, and it will transcribe the enzyme lactase. So the operon contains one or more structural genes, at least in a bacterial operon, and the controlling regions around that structural gene. Now, eukaryotic operons are similar, except they only have one structural gene for each operon. So, so, we have the uh, Z gene, the enzyme lactase, for metabolizing the sugar lactose. But we also have the Y and the A structural genes, and they are on a separate operon because there's only one structural gene in each eukaryotic operon. Uh, but the eukaryotic operons have more regulation than the bacterial operons. And then other than that, we're not going to talk about eukaryotic operons. Any question about any of that? Okay, let's look at the bacterial operon and the lac operon a little bit further, and let me state that the LAC operon is an inducible operon, meaning the gene is normally turned off, the lactase gene, but it can be induced to be turned on. So when we're looking at uh, the LAC operon, it is normally turned off, and how it's normally turned off is there's an I gene, which is really close to the LAC operon, because LAC operon is this region here. Let me go back to the previous slide. If I can do that. The I gene is a regulatory gene, but it regulates the LAC operon. It is not part of the LAC operon. It is its own operon, which is not shown here. But it regulates the LAC operon. Normally, most genes that regulate an operon are nowhere near the gene that they regulate or the operon that they regulate. But in the case of the LAC operon, the gene that regulates the LAC operon happens to be close, actually right next door, to the gene that it regulates. That's very unusual. On eukaryotes, the genes that regulate the operon tend to be on a different chromosome than the operon that they're regulating. And even for uh, prokaryotes, bacterial operons, usually the regulatory gene is nowhere near the gene that it's regulating. Is that clear to everyone? Just with the LAC operon, the regulatory gene happens to be right next door to the operon that it's regulating. So when the regulatory gene, which is I, is expressed. It makes a messenger RNA, which is then translated into a protein, which is called the repressor protein. The job of the repressor protein is to come 
and bind to the operator. And then when the RNA polymerase binds to the promoter and then moves down the DNA, it gets stuck by the repressor protein and cannot move any further than the operator. And that shuts down the lac operon so that the structural genes like lactase is not transcribed normally in a bacteria such as E. coli. Any questions about any of that? So normally in E. coli, in most bacteria, the lac operon is shut down, and that's because of the repressor protein being made by the I gene. Well, how do we turn on the gene? Well, when the sugar lactose is around, allolactose is around because allolactose is a, a stereo isomer of lactose. Do you guys understand what I'm trying to, to say? A stereo isomer is a mirror image of the molecule. It's just that it's the left hand or the right hand. Uh, if you know what I'm trying to illustrate. And we're not really going to talk much about allolactose as a stereoisomer. It's just that whenever lactose is around, allolactose is around. So if the sugar lactose is around, allolactose will be around. And if allolactose is around, it binds to the repressor protein and then inactivates it. If the repressor protein is inactivated, it cannot bind to the operator. And then when the RNA polymerase binds to the promoter, it'll then move down the DNA and transcribe the DNA, making the enzyme lactase. Any questions about that? There should be one question, and there could be more than one. Well, what's unusual about this messenger RNA that's made by the RNA polymerase when it binds to the promoter and then moves down the DNA of the lac operon? What's unusual about that messenger RNA? Um, it has three proteins on it. Yes. This messenger RNA doesn't make one protein. It makes three proteins. Uh, Beta-galactosidase is another name for lactase. And we've already talked about the enzyme lactase. Permease is the protein that is the transport protein that brings the sugar lactose across the cell membrane and into the cell. And transacetylase is an enzyme that is involved in converting uh, galactose to the sugar glucose. But the point is that this messenger RNA makes three different proteins and you'll never see that in a eukaryotic operon, but you can see it in some bacterial operons, such as the lac operon. The other question I'm going to ask about is, what happens to the repressor protein when it is bound to the operator? How does it come off the operator so that the uh, inducer of lactose can bind to it and then inactivate it. 
Anybody have a guess? Nobody wants to take a guess? Well, uh, what happens is the binding of the repressor protein is not permanent. It binds by a stoichy, uh, what's the word, stoichiomic reaction. That might not be quite the word. And every once in a while, the repressor protein falls off. And when it falls off, if the uh, allolactose is around, it will bind to it and inactivate it. And if it gets inactivated, and then the other repressor protein is inactivated, none of it can bind to the operator, and then the gene is turned on. So the binding of the repressor protein is not permanent, and every once in a while, the repressor protein will fall off. Now, if there's no allolactose around, another repressor protein or the same repressor protein will bind to the operator, and that will shut down the uh, lac operon. But if the sugar lactose is around, then allolactose will be around, and it will bind to the repressor protein, inactivating it, and then the lac operon will be turned on. Here's another question for you. What happens to the RNA polymerase? I should have asked this earlier. But what happens to the RNA polymerase when it binds to the promoter and then moves down to the operator and it gets stopped by the repressor protein. Does that RNA polymerase just get stuck there and stay there forever, at least until the uh, repressor protein falls off? Any guess about that? Maybe Nobody maybe wants to guess. Up, oh, I'm hearing somebody, just a minute. Let me turn up the volume. Okay, can you say that again? Um, yeah, maybe it dissociates off. Yes, the repressor protein doesn't bind permanently, and every once in a while it'll fall off. And so if it gets stuck at the operator by the repressor protein, the RNA polymerase will eventually fall off, and then it can bind to another promoter. It doesn't have to be on the LAC operon. It can be another operon, or it could be bind to the LAC operon promoter again. The point is the RNA polymerase is not permanently stuck here. Okay. Now here's a hard question. Why is the lactase gene an inducible gene in E. coli. Where do we find the sugar lactose? In milk? Okay, I know you know the question, where do we find the sugar lactose? You find in lactose? In? Sorry, I didn't hear you. Uh, milk? Yeah, you find it in milk and dairy products. And how common are milk and dairy products? Not common. No, they're not very common. So unless that E. coli is on a dairy farm, it's not likely to see the sugar lactose. And that is why E. coli turns off the lac, lac, lac gene, or lac structure uh, operon, because the sugar lactose is uncommon. So E. coli doesn't want to express the genes 
of the lac operon because the sugar lactose is uncommon. Unless E. coli is on a dairy farm or is in somebody's gut who uh, consumes dairy products, E. coli is not likely to see the sugar lactose. So if it's out in the soil or on an apple tree or, I don't know, on the road, on your desk, the uh, E. coli is not going to see the sugar lactose. And so it turns the gene off. And that's why it's an inducible uh, operon. But if the sugar lactose is around, it'll want to metabolize that sugar. And so it is inducible and it will turn on the lac operon if the sugar lactose is around. Does everybody see why this makes sense for E. coli? It doesn't want to waste energy making these uh, proteins if the sugar lactose is around and most of the time the lactose will not be around E. coli. All right, any questions about the lac operon? If not, let's watch a little video. This will probably take a while to load, but I've got a little video that's pretty good on the lac operon. It's not too long. The E. coli lac operon is an example of an inducible set of genes. These genes are responsible for the breakdown of lactose into sugars used for cellular metabolism. This inducible system also involves bacterial DNA, a repressor, mRNA, and the sugar molecule lactose. This animation will only focus on two of the three proteins encoded by the lac operon, beta-galactosidase and permease. Gene expression can be induced or turned on when a specific inducer molecule appears in the cell. For inducible systems, a repressor molecule prevents gene expression by binding to the upstream controlling region. Lactose is the lac operon inducer molecule. After first appearing in the cellular environment, lactose passively enters the E. coli cell and binds to the repressor molecule. This binding releases the repressor from the controlling region. At this point, RNA polymerase can begin transcription of the operon. Here we show two of the three lac operon genes being transcribed into mRNA. Ribosomes then bind to the mRNA and the two proteins are translated. The first protein is beta-galactosidase, which breaks down lactose into two simple sugars. The second protein is permease, a membrane-bound protein. When embedded in the cell membrane, permease functions to provide a direct route for the lactose outside the cell to be imported into the cell. This import occurs at a much greater rate than the passive transfer we first observed. Because translation continues inside the cell, other permease proteins become embedded in the membrane. This further increases the rate at which lactose enters the cell. Beta-galactosidase breaks the cellular lactose into the simple sugars glucose and galactose. Once its concentration is greatly reduced, the lactose bound to the repressor are released. At this point, the repressor again binds to the controlling region and gene expression is halted. For all inducible systems like the lac operon, it is the interaction of the repressor and inducer molecules that mediate gene expression. 
Okay, any questions about the video? Any questions about the Lac Opera? If not, let's go on to mutation. <clears throat> uh, mutation is a change in the genetic material. Mutations may be neutral, meaning they give no benefit or they give no harm. They may be beneficial, giving the uh, organism a reproductive advantage, or they may be harmful, meaning uh, they make uh, uh, it less likely that the organism will uh, reproduce. A mutagen is an agent that causes mutations. Mutations can also occur by spontaneous mutation, where the mutation occurs in the absence of a mutagen. And here we're looking at a mutation. Now, uh, there are different types of mutations, and you're going to cover this in the uh, uh, worksheet, but I think I'll briefly go through it uh, quickly, the, uh, just talking in, in general about the different types of mutation. There's a base substitution, which is a point mutation, where one base is substituted for another base. And there can be different types of uh, base substitutions. There can be a silent mutation, a missense mutation, or a nonsense mutation. <clears throat> and you'll learn about those in the worksheet. There's also a frame shift mutation where a base gets added or subtracted from the sequence of DNA. And because a base is added or subtracted, that changes the codons after that point. And that is why we call it a frame shift mutation. There is also a macro mutation, and you should pay attention to this one because it is not discussed in the book. It's where an entire region of a chromosome, or perhaps an entire chromosome, is added or deleted. So it's an entire region of DNA that is added or deleted. And that we call a macromutation. And for some reason, your book does not discuss it. Uh, here is a possible picture of a mutation. It's hard to see. Maybe I can blow that up. But spoons are being, well, uh, the, the child is attracting spoons to his skin. And the mutation is maybe magnetic, or uh, maybe he just has sticky skin, where the spoons, sorry, this keeps moving on me. Uh, the spoons are uh, attracted to the skin. And they were looking into this. I have no idea what the answer turned up to be. Is this child a mutation? Or is it that he just never washes and his skin is all sticky? I don't know the question. I guess I should say I don't know the answer. Uh, a base substitution is where a base gets substituted. Let me see if I can blow this up. So, oops, trying to move that out of the way. The uh, base is normally GC. And where the heck is it? There it is there. And then when it gets replicated, instead of a C being put in there, a T gets put in by mistake. And then when this gets replicated, we will change the sequence of the DNA. Instead of that being a GC in the, the uh, newly replicated uh, DNA, it'll change to a TA. And there, the G will actually be replicated correctly. 
so it will be a GC when the DNA gets replicated, meaning this strand will replicate correctly, this strand will replicate incorrectly, and that will lead to a mutation. And in this case, the amino acid will be changed, why well, it's a base substitution, from cysteine to the amino acid tyrosine. Any question about any of that? Now, a base substitution can be a silent mutation where you change one base in the DNA, but it does not result in an amino acid change in the protein. And we talked about this a little earlier. Uh, some, most of the codons have more than one codon coding for the same amino acid like phenylalanine, UUU, and UUC code for the same amino acid. So if the uh, nucleotide gets changed from UUU to UUC, it'll be a silent mutation because the protein will remain the same. Okay? And then leucine has six codons coding for the same amino acid. Uh, most of the codons have more than one codon coding for the same amino acid. There are two, like uh, methionine, where there's only one AUG coding for it. And where is the other one? There it is. Uh, tryptophan only has one codon coding for it. Anyway, it's a silent mutation. The DNA gets changed, but the protein is not because the codon still codes for the same amino acid. So there's no effect on the protein function. So we call it a silent mutation. A missense mutation is where you change one base and it results in an amino acid difference which changes the protein. For example, uh, the amino acid, where is that? CCG clothes codes for the amino acid glycine in, uh, what do you call this, the uh, blood protein that when it's mutated, we call it the sickle cell anemia gene. And when it gets mutated from GGC to A, G, C, we then have the sickle cell protein, which the amino acid change is serine, and that's a different amino acid in the protein, and we call it a missense mutation because it results in a missense in the amino acid in this position. Okay? And in um, uh, the, uh, let's see, this is the uh, hemoglobin protein. One amino acid is changed out of thousands of them. I don't remember how many thousands, but it's over 1,000. One amino acid is changed, and it really changes the protein from a normal protein, a normal hemoglobin, to a sickle cell anemia protein. Any question about that? Another example of a missense mutation was 10,000 years ago in Northern Europe, there was a missense and the brown-eyed allele was changed into the blue-eyed allele. 
before 10,000 years ago, humans only had brown eyes. And 10,000 years ago in Northern Europe, the blue-eyed allele was created probably by spontaneous mutation, resulting in humans having two eye colors or two major eye colors, bluish eyes and brownish eyes. Any question about that? All right. If no questions, let's move further. A nonsense mutation is where you change one base to a stop codon. And that's nonsense because uh, instead of translating the rest of the protein, you get a truncated protein. So uh, the protein, I don't know what it would be before that, but let's say it has a whole slew of other amino acids after this point, and the amino acid codon gets changed to a stop codon, and then only one, two, three, four amino acids are made for this protein, greatly reducing the size of this protein and probably reducing the function of this protein. An example of this is some muscular dystrophy and cystic fibrosis patients have a nonsense mutation resulting in a shorter protein which does not function correctly. Oh, sorry. Uh, this example, the protein is only four and the second one gets the missense or nonsense mutation and change to a stop codon. So we're only making one amino acid. This is a very idealistic example. There's almost no protein that has four amino acids. Normally proteins are quite large, having hundreds or thousands of amino acids. Okay. Anyways, nonsense. You get a truncated protein because a stop codon gets put in where there should be an amino acid. A frame, frame shift mutation is where you insert or delete one or more bases into the DNA. So normally we have uh, the codon AAA and then the, uh, the uh, protein would be methionine, lysine, phenylalanine, glycine, and then the stop codon. Well, when we change that, in this case, we're removing one uh, nucleotide. Instead of having AAA, we now have AA but the codon will be read as AAC and that will change this codon and then instead of having CCG as the next codon we will have CGA so you always read three and the point is that after this point here all the codons will be changed after that point. And that's why we call it a frame, cis, frame shift mutation, where one or more codons, or um, one or more nucleotides gets changed. And after that point, it changes all other codons. There is a rare frame shift mutation which only changes one codon and that is if you remove or add three codons then only one codon gets changed 
because you're removing a multiple of three. So for example, if you remove AAA, you will get a protein without having the amino acid phenylalanine, but the other codons will be read correctly because you're removing an entire codon. And that's the same if you were to add three uh, nucleotides. You would once again add an amino acid right here, but after that point, it would be the same. This is very rare, a frame shift mutation like that. Most of the time we're inserting or deleting a single nucleotide, in which case all of the codons after that will be changed. Any question about frame shift mutations? All right, no questions, let's move on. So the causes of mutation can be from spontaneous mutation or they can be from a mutagen. Mutagens are of two types, radiation and chemical mutagens. When we're talking about uh, radiation, you should realize that there are two types of radiation that can cause a mutation. There is ionizing radiation, and that would be like X-rays and gamma rays. These forms of radiation have a lot of energy and the cause the formation of ions, why it's called ionizing ray radiation. When this radiation it's a um, atom or a molecule that causes ions and what it does is it gives the electron so much energy that that electron actually leaves the molecule or the atom creating an ion and then this ion can react with other molecules in the cell including DNA and usually if an ion reacts with DNA, it can cause a mutation. Uh, the other form of uh, radiation that can cause a mutation is non-ionizing radiation, and that is UV radiation. When UV hits DNA, it causes uh, two adjacent thymines to form a dimer where the thymer, thymines, the two thymines together, actually form a covalent bond between them. And when they do that, the thymines do not hydrogen bond with the uh, corresponding A molecules or A nucleotides in the other strand of DNA. That creates a bubble in the DNA that cannot be replicated or transcribed. So non-ionizing radiation, which is UV light, does create a problem in the DNA which could lead to mutation, but it also stops DNA replication and DNA transcription. Okay? We're not gonna cover light repair. All right, any questions about how radiation can mutate DNA? If not, let's talk to about chemical mutagens. Nitrous acid uh, is a mutagen which changes DNA, mutates it. Nitrous acid, what it does, uh, here we got the bases C, G, A, 
Well, nitrous acid can bind to that A and change it so that the A, this altered A, I should call it, will not bind to the T, and instead this altered A will bind to a C, so that when the DNA polymerase uh, is reading this DNA, this altered A, instead of being uh, a T put here, the polymerase will put a C there. And then later, when this is, uh, I'm trying to get over here, when this is um, replicated further, the C will be kept as the original and it will uh, pair with the G and that will cause a permanent mutation. And then the A, the altered A here, will once again pair with the C. So this altered A isn't acting as an A nucleotide, it's acting as a G nucleotide. And that's how nitrous acid can act as a mutagen. Any questions about any of that? All right, if there's no questions, let's talk about the frequency of a mutation. Whenever DNA is replicated, the spontaneous mutation rate is one mistake in 10 to the ninth replicated basis. So DNA polymerase will make, excuse me, will make a mistake one time in 10 to the 9th basis that are replicated. Any question about any of that? Now, on average, there are a thousand nucleotides for a gene. And that means that if one in 10 to the 9th uh, basis is going to have a mutation, spontaneous mutation. That means one in 10 to the six replicated genes will have a mutation. So when we're talking about the human population, which is way larger than a million, if we're looking at only one gene, you can see that with the human population, one child in a million will be mutated for that gene. And that's just by spontaneous mutation. Any question about any of that? So in the human population, we have lots of mutations occurring when children are born. Every a million births uh, for one gene, you would have a mutation. Any questions about any of that? Anyone know the population of the world? I think it's something like close to 8 billion, between 7 and 8 billion. So it's way over 1 million. Just something to think about. Obviously, if you're having children, you probably don't want to have a mutated baby, but every once in a while it will happen. Uh, sickle cell anemia uh, is one that happened a long time ago in Africa and uh, the reason why it became so prevalent in the uh, regions of Africa where it's found is because the heterozygote has a reproductive advantage 
in the regions where malaria is found. It's just that if you have two sickle cell genes, you don't have a reproductive advantage. You have a reproductive disadvantage and the uh, person will be sickle cell anemia and will be of ill health. Any question about any of that? Okay, if there's no questions, let's move on and say that mutations increase the mutation rate. So instead of one in 10 to the six replicated genes being rep, uh, mutated, we will increase it to one in a thousand or one in 10 to the fifth replicated genes being mutated, meaning a mutagen generally will increase the mutation rate by tenfold to a thousandfold. Does anyone know, besides, I guess, sunlight, so not counting sunlight, uh, which uh, actually uh, our skin is very good at repairing uh, that mutation or the, uh, the DNA damage from UV light. So when you get exposed to sunlight, you're generally okay as long as you don't get burned, meaning your skin will, given time, repair the damage. But does anyone know the uh, most common mutagen that humans are exposed to from uh, mutagen. Nobody's going to take a guess. Uh, it's cigarette smoke. It's the most common uh, human mutagen other than, of course, sunlight uh, being a, a mutagen. <clears throat> you can identify mutants experimentally, and that's where you can test for a mutant in two ways. You can use positive direct selection, or you can use negative indirect selection. If you're using positive direct selection, you're detecting a mutant cell or organism because they grow or appear different. For example, if this were to go walking down the street, everyone would say, yep, there goes a mut mutation. Right? Uh, negative indirect selection is a little more difficult. And here you're detecting the mutant cell because they do not grow. I'm going to talk a little bit about negative selection. I actually did this. It's where you replica plate, a plate of bacteria that have isolated colonies. And what you do is you get a velvet stamper and you stamp the velvet on the colonies, and then the velvet picks up the cells, and then you can stamp the velvet on a new plate of auger and on a different plate of auger. We'll talk about the differences in a moment. And then where the stamp puts cells, you can see colonies develop on the plate. And that would be the same location, which I think is right here on this plate. You can detect a negative mutation by having different media that you stamp the velvet on. So you could stamp the velvet on a Petri dish containing media that has the amino acid histidine and you can stamp the cells on a plate of media that is lacking 
the amino acid histidine. If this colony does not grow on the media lacking the amino acid histidine, but the colony will grow on the media that has the amino acid histidine in it, we can say that this colony or these cells here and those cells there, I think, and those cells there are mutants in that they will only grow if you supply the amino acid histidine in the media. If that amino acid is lacking, then those cells will not grow. And this is negative selection for a mutation. Any question about any of that? If there's no question, let's move on. And we're going to change gears, no longer talking about mutation and spontaneous mutation and other ways that cells acquire differences. We're going to talk about genetic recombination. Recombination is the exchange of genes between two DNA molecules. Uh, recombination does not create new genetic differences, but it can create uh, it can create new combinations of genes that had never been together before. For example, if you put the blue eye gene and the blonde uh, hair gene, and what would be another one? Six-fingered gene, all together, that would be a new combination. And then that could be passed on, and then the offspring could get all of those uh, genetic traits. And that would be a new, I don't know, recombination of the different genes. So you could see an individual who is blonde haired. You could see, what was the other example I gave? Blue eye. And you could see someone who had six fingers. But now, because of genetic recombination, you can see all of those traits in one individual. And that happens because the gene, the genes become re recombine. So initially we had one DNA molecule that had all of the lowercase alleles, lowercase e, f, g, h, and i, and it can get together with another chromosome having all capital alleles, capital E, F, G, and H, and i. And one way recombination can happen is by crossing over where the DNA literally cross over and then the, the uh, DNA molecule breaks or the chromosome breaks and then switches positions with the other chromosome. So initially we had only the capital alleles and now we have the chromosome with capital E, F, and G but instead of having capital H and I, it has lowercase h and lowercase i. And this puts a new combination of genes that had not been seen before. Capital E, capital F, capital G, lowercase h, and lowercase i. And the other chromosome is also recombined, and it will be lowercase e, lowercase f, lowercase g and then uppercase H and uppercase I. And that happened because the chromosomes crossed over right here, and then the capital H and capital I switch places with the lowercase H and the lowercase I. Any question about any of that?
If there's no questions, let me ask, is recombination the same thing as crossing over, or is it something different? What do you think? Is it the same, or is it something different? Or somewhere in the middle? Can you repeat that? Crossing over is the same. Yeah. Um, it seems like crossing over is a type of recombination. Yes, you got it right on the head, and that is crossing over is a type of recombination, and it's uh, it is more narrow uh, in its meaning than recombination. Crossing over specifically means the chromosomes are crossing over and then exchanging places. Recombination is a more general term, uh, talking about the exchange of genes on two DNA molecules. So they are slightly different, and recombination is, oh, a little bit more broader term than crossing over. But they are similar, okay? And they are slightly different. All right. Let's talk about genetic transfer. Vertical gene transfer occurs during reproduction or between generations of cells where the genetic information is passed from the parents to the offspring at least in humans, it's two parents to one offspring. But it can also be talked about with cells where one parent passes on its genetic information to two daughter cells. And that's vertical gene transfer. Horizontal gene transfer is the transfer of genes between cells of the same generation and that is between a donor cell and a recipient cell. There are three types of horizontal gene transfer. Uh, gene transfer. Transformation, conjugation, and transduction. We'll talk about all three of these. Transformation is where a naked piece of DNA is in the environment and that naked piece of DNA gets incorporated into a recipient cell. Where did this naked piece of DNA come from? Another cell? Yeah, it probably came from another cell, and that cell probably died. And that's why the DNA is now naked and in the environment. Now in the lab, you can pull this DNA out of a cell and purify it, but that'll kill the cells. And then expose it to a recipient cell and get it to be taken up. So transformation can happen in the lab all the time. It does happen in genetic, molecular genetic labs all the time. And when it is incorporated into the cell, it can be recombined with the cell's chromosome. And we're not going to go into it in great detail, but, oops, went too far. but it uh, recombines with the region of the chromosome, usually a similar region of the chromosome, and then that lowercase a gene can come into the cell. This gene never had the lowercase a gene, and it brings in a piece of DNA having the lowercase a gene, 
and then the lowercase a gene is uh, incorporated into the cell, gets expressed by the host cell chromosome, and uh, then this cell can express the lowercase gene. So that a new gene, the lowercase a gene, can come into this cell and be expressed. And that is transformation. Any questions about transformation? All right, no questions. Let me state that you'll notice that usually more than, I don't know, one gene or more, how do I say that? A larger piece of DNA is brought into the cell than recombines with the cell so that the other regions B, C, and D uh, do not recombine with the cell and they will be uh, degraded and then the nucleotides will be used by the, uh, the cell when it is replicating or maybe being transcribed. Any question about any of that? The point is that transformation is one way of a cell to get a new gene that is pre-existing, the lowercase a gene, and then this recipient cell can express that lowercase a gene. This is important for you guys because most of you will be working in a hospital and one way that a cell can uh, become resistant to a uh, antibiotic is, is that the cell can be transformed, pick up the gene for the resistance to that antibiotic. And obviously the cell could always mutate and pick up the resistance to the antibiotic. But if we look at the frequency of the mutation being picked up by transformation and the frequency of the mutation happening by spontaneous mutation, which do you think is more common, transformation or spontaneous mutation? You don't want to guess? Transformation is about 10 times more common than spontaneous mutation. So if a cell picks up antibiotic resistance, that could be from transformation. And it's 10 times more likely to be from transformation than from spontaneous mutation. Any question about any of that? Now, with that said, you can't have transformation until you've had spontaneous mutation because transformation means the gene has to exist someplace in the world before transformation can happen. So if the lowercase a gene does not exist, it does have to come into existence by spontaneous mutation before it can come, well, before transformation can happen. Transformation can only happen if the gene exists someplace in the world. Any question about any of that? Okay, this picture is showing you transformation where a cell takes up a piece of foreign DNA 
and then starts expressing that DNA, getting some indigestion, and then the cell can have its phenotype changed because of transformation. Any question about any of that? And the phenotype gets changed because it's picking up a new gene, which then becomes expressed, changing the phenotype of this cell. All right. I think we'll stop here because we've only got two more minutes. And so I'm going to come back here and ask, are there any questions so far in this lecture? If not, I'll see you at 6.30 for the lab. All right. I'm going to stop, and I'll see you at 6.30.